Well, hello again, friends and neighbors and fellow Christians, and welcome back to another study where we are studying the scriptures and searching and uh, as we consider uh, the typical objections that are raised against preterism. And I appreciate you tuning into our studies here at What the Bible Says Ministry. And I want to thank all of you uh, for the, the good comments and uh, the encouragement that uh, many of you have expressed uh, toward the uh, studies and the material that we have been presenting in this series of studies. And I thank you so much for that. And I continue to ask that you will share these videos, uh, that you will like them. You, uh, if, uh, if you're new to the series, again, please go back to the beginning and watch number one all the way through so that you can come up to speed, uh, so to speak, on where we are at as we establish point by point and then build upon of the things that we've already established so do that uh, and uh, if you've not subscribed then please like and subscribe uh, and click the little button there in, in the in the corner so that you'll receive notifications each time that we post a video and uh, as always I encourage you to study along with these things uh, and that's uh, that's the only thing that I ask of you uh, is a little of your time I'm not interested in your money I want you to look into what your Bible says and don't, uh, don't take my word for anything that I say. Search this out in your Bible. Listen. I, I, I hope that you'll listen. But I want you to search and research and investigate and exegete the Scriptures. Okay? Because the Bible's right. All right? No matter what you think, no matter what I think, what you say or what I say, the Bible is right. Okay? And I think we probably all agree on that, at least. Uh, so we need to do our best to handle the right God's inspired word that he has so blessed us to have and with all the wonderful tools that we have where we can look into these things and study and research the original languages and so forth. So again, I, I just I, I ask that you uh, share these things, these videos with your friends, your neighbors, uh, your, your fellow Christians in whatever part of the world you're in and encourage them to study along with us and this will help us to spread the good news that Jesus kept his promise and God kept his promises on time just exactly the way that he promised that he would. And we today are living in the fulfillment of the blessings of the kingdom. Now in the past few videos I have demonstrated and have been demonstrating the faulty reasoning of the futurists who misinterpret, for instance, uh, Matthew 5, 17, and 18, by ripping the qualifier out of Jesus' prediction of his death, burial, and resurrection in Luke 18, verse 31, for instance. And they insert that qualifier into the text of Matthew 5, 17, and 18 in order to reconstruct the words of Jesus to fit their presuppositions. Now, I have demonstrated thus far in every one of these videos of this series that every text that they call upon as their refutation, well, it disintegrates under the exegesis of the context. And I have shown from the context of Acts 21 that literally tens of thousands of Jewish Christians, including Paul, were zealously observing the law of Moses. And even as it says there that Paul, that he uh, walked orderly, which means in military lockstep, keeping the law of Moses, and this proves beyond any question that there was indeed a transition period when the two covenants uh, coexisted concurrently, just like Isaac and Ishmael lived in the same house for a brief period of time. And I showed you an example of Paul urging his countrymen to accept and obey Messiah so that what was predicted in the prophets would not come upon them. And this was in Acts chapter 13. But you know, tragically, just a few years after Paul wrote those words, what was predicted in Moses and in the prophets did come upon them, and they were destroyed with flaming fire from the and they were and uh, when the Lord came in flaming fire, and they were destroyed with everlasting punishment from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. And I have shown uh, not only uh, do futurists have to divorce uh, verse 18 from verse 17 of Matthew 5 to force it into their paradigm, 
they likewise have to divorce the Son of Man coming in power and glory from his coming in his kingdom. You see, Matthew 16, 28, Mark 9, 1, and Luke 9, 27 are exactly parallel. And Matthew 16 says that they would see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom, while Mark 9, 1 says that they would see the kingdom coming with power, while Luke 9, 27 says they would see the kingdom of God. So you see, those phrases are synonymous. They mean the same thing, you see. So, because Jesus said, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they, and whatever those three phrases you look at, they have to concur, you see. They would see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. They would see the kingdom come with power. They would see the kingdom of God. So they have to divorce the Son of Man coming in power and glory from his coming in his kingdom. That is why that I keep saying, folks, there's only one prediction of the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with his angels at the judgment. And it would be at the establishment of the kingdom when it would come in its completeness. And you cannot divorce the coming of the Son of Man in the clouds of heaven from the Son of Man coming in his kingdom with power. You just can't do that. Now, they also have to divorce uh, these three verses from the respective preceding verses just like they do with Matthew 5, 17, and 18. And this is what they do. But then they have the audacity to accuse preterists of reconstructing the scriptures. But you see, that just won't work. Why? Because Jesus tied the coming of the kingdom, which would be when the Son of Man would come in the clouds of heaven, Matthew 24, 30. Okay? Jesus tied that to a specific event. And that would be when every stone was thrown down there. He said, there will not be left one stone here upon another that shall not be thrown down. And he tied the coming of the kingdom. He said, when you see all these things, know ye that the kingdom of God has drawn near. Luke 21 and verse 31. Now, if you will recall, we were looking at some of the statements uh, in this article here that was written by Brother Travis Main, and we looked at where he made the statement that the majority of full preterists teach that once Christ came the second time in 70 AD, heaven came to stay on earth. Okay, well, that is a misrepresentation, <clears throat> as I pointed out in the last video, but let's continue on where I dropped down to the 10th paragraph, and he says, in addressing what happens to hope if earth is heaven, and this is one of those, in other words, uh, renditions where a person gives an explanation of a particular thing and then that goes through the process of their mind and they say, well, in other words, you really mean, and they completely botch up what was just told them so that they can misrepresent you to try to bolster their paradigm. Well, that's what this is. Because I could understand if he had said what happens to hope if heaven is earth and he just omitted the word on, which would concur with what he said earlier, that heaven came to stay on earth. But this is completely reversed. Okay, So just a, a complete fabrication, fabrication and a complete uh, misrepresentation. Uh, but anyway, as we continue on, uh, he points out that... Uh, uh, he was told that uh, there were many mansions in the Father's house that Jesus went away to prepare them, John 14, 2. Uh, the mansions were said to be Christians. Uh, Revelation speaks of the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven, Revelation 21 and verse 2. Uh, the Father's house, the kingdom, the mature church, heaven placed on earth in 70 AD, the hope should be replaced with the reality of the blessings in front of us according to the preterist. Now, again, as I stated in the previous video, he never touched the argument that was presented to him. He only misrepresented it. Okay, and then we come on down to uh, paragraph number 16, and he attempts to clear up <laughs> the new heavens and earth situation. And uh, we've covered that, but I wanted to just to refresh your memory that he said, the term new heavens and new earth is used in Isaiah 65 and 66, as well as in 2 Peter 3 and Revelation 21. It references the changing of an environment 
uh, the folks Peter was writing to, who was Peter writing to? Peter was writing to the diaspora. 1 Peter 1, verse 1, the strangers scattered about the diaspora who were living among the Gentiles, 1 Peter 2 and verse 12. Okay, this is who Peter was writing to, the ten northern tribes. He was writing to the diaspora, okay? He wasn't writing to you and me, okay? He was writing to the diaspora. But notice that he says here then, um, he mentions Second uh, Peter 3, and he mentions the new heavens and new earth, and uh, he says the final portion of Scripture to be focused on is Second Peter 3. Uh, now, again, we're not going to get to that just yet. We'll get to that eventually. But I wanted to notice here, he says, starting with verse 3, prayer to focus on the last days. Well, no, folks. We don't start with verse 3 in 2 Peter 3. We start with verse 1. Actually, we start with chapter 2. Actually, we go all the way back to 1 Peter uh, 4, even, uh, where he said, The end of all things is at hand. The time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. 1 Peter 4, 7, 5, 7, and 17. Look those up, okay? No, we don't start at verse 3 in 2 Peter 3. We start with verse 1. And as I said, we go back to chapter 2 because that's where the pattern is established. Uh, and again, we'll get into that, uh, Lord willing, as this series uh, progresses. But we look at 2 Peter 3, verse 1, and Peter says, This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both, that's the first epistle and the second epistle, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of our Lord and Savior. So what Peter is about to tell them in this chapter, he is reminding them of what the holy prophets had said. Okay, And then when you go down to verse 13, he says, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Now, uh, <clears throat> again, in the article, Brother Travis, he mentions the new heavens and the new earth uh, of Isaiah 65 and 66. He mentions Revelation 21, verse 2 in particular, and the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. And uh, I want us... That's where I want we want us to begin our study is in the prophecies of the the holy prophets of Moses and the prophets because Peter said I'm stirring I'm going to put you in remembrance and stir your minds up away remembrance of what the prophets had said and then he says nevertheless we according to his promise okay this is why we want to investigate the holy prophets predictions of the new heavens and the new earth because that is the library, if you will. That is the foundation, that is the fountain of knowledge from which Peter is drawing and is going to explain to them about the new heavens and the new earth. So this is why we want to look at the prophets, okay? Because according, he says, according to his promise, that's prophecy, we look for new heavens and a new earth. And... I want us to begin our investigation in Isaiah chapter 2. Okay, now we'll go down here if my uh, electronic things work properly this time. We want to look at Isaiah 2, and again, I'm not going to read all, I'm going to look at chapters 2 through 4, and I'm not going to read all the text. You do that on your own time. I want to point out some highlights here to show you the timing and the context, okay? So he says here, the word of Isaiah, the son of Amos, uh, what he saw, concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Okay, so here's the subject. It shall come to pass in the last days. So here's the time frame. Okay, that should be pretty simple, uh, pretty elementary. Uh, we should have no trouble whatsoever agreeing on the time frame. Okay, it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow into it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, 
and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Now, this text right here is one of the go-to prophecies of Church of Christ preachers. And again, I say that because that's what I used to do. Okay, I've quoted this thing over and over and over again. And we go to this passage right here, this prophecy, to establish the time frame of the establishment of the church. Okay, the house right here, the house of God. You see that? The house of God is the church, the house of the God of Jacob. So this is dealing with the last days when the church would be established. Okay, so I mean, th there's no question about this within the churches of Christ. But here's what, see, and as, as I said, this, this text right here was what we always quoted, but the thing is, we stopped right here where this little period is. And see, that's a problem. Why? Because the very next word is and. Do you see that? And is a conjunction. Just like is used right here. Okay? And just like is used right here. Okay? And see, these things are connected. And, notice what he says here, and he shall judge among the nations. Hmm. All right, we already have uh, a, a different idea emerging here. Something that we've never seen before because we always stopped right here in quoting this text to prove that the church was established in the first century. Okay? But he says, and, that's in conjunction with in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house and the house of God of Jacob would be established. Okay? And these are things concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Okay? And he shall judge among the nations and rebuke many people and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Okay? I'm going to skip down some. Now, again, you, you pause the video and you read all this text on your own time. Okay, just to make sure that I'm not hiding anything, and that's that's not my intent. I just don't have a whole lot of time, okay? Their land also is full of idols. They worship the work of their own hands, that which their own fingers have made. See, they were, uh, were just like Paul said in Romans chapter 1, that they worship the, the creature more than the creator, okay? So they're worshiping the idols and the, and the figurines which they've made with their own hands. But he says, And the mean man boweth down to the, uh, the images, and the great man humbleth himself, to the idols, the things they made the, right there, their idols, that they made with their own fingers. Therefore forgive them not. Enter into the rock and hide thee in the dust, for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty. Now, we're going to see this phrase again. That's why I've got it highlighted, okay? I'm going to hang on to that, and we're going to put these things together eventually. Okay, now, notice then, in verse 11, the lofty looks of man shall be humbled, and the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. Well, in what day? In this last day's time period concerning Judah and Jerusalem in which the church, the kingdom would be established and when he would judge among the nations. In that day. You see that? In that day. For the day of the Lord. See that? This is a last day's day of the Lord prediction. Do you see the context there? Okay. The day of the Lord. Okay. So we keep on reading. And, and again, he, he noticed that he repeats this. Verse 11 is identical to verse 17. The loftiness of man shall be bowed down. The haughtiness of man shall be made low. The Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. Okay. So verse 17 is not a different day than verse 11. Okay. He's repeating it. So now notice that the day of the Lord and notice that, enter into the rock, hide thee in the dust, for the fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty. So we drop down to verse 17. The Lord alone shall be exalted in that day, and the idols he shall utterly abolish. And they shall go into the holes of the rocks and in the caves of the earth for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty. When he ariseth to shake terribly the earth. In that day, again, in what day, friends? What we've just looked at, this last day's day of the Lord when the uh, kingdom would be established when, and he would judge among the nations. Okay, In that day, a man shall cast his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which he, they made each one of 
uh, for himself to worship to the moles and to the bats. So he'll cast his idols of silver and gold to the, to the moles. That they would take them into the caves and the holes of the rocks and hide. Okay, that's what he's saying. In that day, when in this day of judgment, this day of last days, day of the Lord, judgment, okay, when he would arise to shake terribly the earth, to go into the clefts of the rocks and in the tops of the ragged rocks for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty when he arises to shake terribly the earth. Now notice that I've highlighted that phrase, and that phrase is identical, and it is repeated three times in this chapter right here. In this chapter that is dealing with things concerning Judah and Jerusalem that would transpire in the last days when the kingdom would be established and when he would judge among the nations. You see that? Okay, now we're going to go on to chapter 3. For behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, doth take away from Judah and Jerusalem, I read that backwards, Jerusalem and from Judah, the stay of staff and the whole stay of bread and the whole stay of water. So here we have a situation of famine. Okay, The mighty man and the man of war, uh, the judge, the prophet, and the prudent, and the ancient and captain of fifty, and of the honorable man, and the counselor, and the cunning art artificer, and the eloquent orator. And I will give children to be princes, and babes shall rule over them, and the people shall be oppressed. Okay, now, we have a time of famine, and we have a time of oppression. You see that? Okay, and then he says, in that day... So see, he's still talking about the things concerning Judah and Jerusalem, just like he did right here. This is the vision, or the word, the word which Isaiah saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, okay? He's still talking about the same thing, Judah and Jerusalem. And this would be this time, last days, the day of the Lord's judgment, would be a time of famine. It would be a time when people were oppressed. And it will be a time when Jerusalem is ruined and Judah is fallen because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord to provoke his eyes, the eyes of his glory. Okay? They show their countenance, or excuse me, the show of their countenance doth witness against them, and they declare their sin as Sodom. They hide it not. He says then, Say ye to the righteous that it shall be well with him, for they shall eat the fruit of their doings. Woe to the wicked! It shall be ill with him. The Lord standeth up to plead, to stand and standeth to judge the people. The Lord will enter into judgment with the ancients of his people. Do you see that? Again, this is a time of famine. It is a time of oppression. It is a time when Israel would provoke the eyes of God's glory. They would declare their sin as the sin of Sodom. And the Lord would stand to judge the people. He would enter into judgment with the ancients of the people and the princes thereof. For you have eaten up the vineyard. The spoil of the poor is in your houses. James chapter 5. And Lord willing, we'll get to that in the next video. And I will demonstrate to you why we are not living in the last days. And we'll tie this right here in with that. Okay. What mean you that you beat my people to pieces and grind the faces of the poor? In that day, the Lord will take away... See, he's still talking about the same thing. In that day, the Lord will take away the bravery of the tinkling ornaments, and we'll, we'll skip on down. Thy men shall fall by the sword, and thy mighty in the war. Okay, so this was going to be a time of war. It was going to be a time of famine, a time of oppression. It would be a time when the Lord would enter into judgment. Okay, now we go to chapter 4. In that day... So he's still talking to the same, it's still the same prophecy, okay? The same time frame, the last day's day of judgment of the Lord when the kingdom would be established, okay? When the Lord would enter into judgment with the ancients of his people. His people. Who's his people? Those are the Jews. That's Israel, okay? In that day, see that? Again, in that day, see that? Okay? In that day shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely for them that are escaped of Israel. Do you see that, brethren? Look at that. In this predicted last days, day of the Lord, judgment of Israel against old covenant Israel, there would be some who would escape. Do you see that? This categorically demonstrates that this cannot, absolutely cannot be an end of time scenario. Because no one would be able to escape 
the end of time, okay? But there were going to be some who would escape this last day's day of judgment, day of the Lord judgment, you see? Now notice, in that day, verse 1, in that day, verse 2, it'll come to pass that he that is left in Zion, see, some are going to escape, see that? And he that is left in Zion, and he that remaineth in Jerusalem shall be called holy. Everyone that is written among the living in Jerusalem. You see that? When? Look there. There's a time statement. In that day, these things are going to take place. And when the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion, and shall have purged the blood of Jerusalem from the midst thereof, by the spirit of judgment. So there's judgment again. You see that? And this would be when the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and shall have purged the blood of Jerusalem. So now again, when, in reading these prophecies, you have to be able to, to discern between the old Jerusalem, old covenant Jerusalem and Israel, and New Jerusalem, those that escape of Israel who would be left in Zion and would be among the living in Jerusalem. That would be the New Jerusalem. And we'll demonstrate that as we go along through these next uh, several videos as we talk about and study the, the new heavens and the new earth. Now, as we as we have looked at these things here, these prophecies in Isaiah chapters 2, 3, and 4, okay, we have observed that the contextual time frame, the contextual setting for the fulfillment of these things is posited to be fulfilled in the last days. And it would be in the last days with the establishment of the kingdom, the everlasting kingdom, the church, which inarguably is first century fulfillment, folks, okay? Now, in that day would be a last day's day of judgment against Old Covenant Israel. Chapters, uh, chapter 2, verse 5, and chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. And this would be a last day's day of judgment against Israel for the shedding of innocent blood, that is, the martyr vindication, okay? chapter 4, verse 4, and you could compare that with Matthew chapter 23, where Jesus told the scribes and the Pharisees, called him the brood or generation of vipers, and he said, all the righteous bloodshed will come upon this generation, upon you, upon Jerusalem. And he said, uh, all these things will come uh, on, on this generation, okay? And from Isaiah then, this is called the day of the Lord, chapter 2, verse t uh, 12. And it will be a time of famine, chapter 3, verse 1. It would be a time of oppression, chapter 3, verse 5. And it would be a time of war, chapter 3, verse 25. And it would be a last day's, day of the Lord, judgment, in which some would escape this day of the Lord. Chapter 4, verse 2. Again, let me reiterate that categorically, and it just uh, thoroughly proves that this cannot be referring to an end of time scene. Okay? And it would be a time when people, when they would go into the holes of the rocks and the caves of the earth for fear of the Lord and, and, for, the, uh, and for the glory of his majesty. Okay, chapter 2, uh, verses 10, 19, and 21. And that is reiterated three times, as I said there in chapter 2, that they would go into the holes of the rocks and the caves of the earth for the fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty. Uh, I keep emphasizing that phrase for a reason, and I want to show you why as we continue on. Now, now, we're going to move on in our study, and we're going to come over to the Thessalonian epistles. So we're going to come back down to the desktop here. Hopefully my everything works out right. So, as I said, we're going to come over to some of Paul's writings, and we're going to look at uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, and I want you to pay particular attention to this portion of the text right here. He says, for you, brethren, now again, who's he writing to? He's writing to the Thessalonian Christians, okay? You, that's the Thessalonians, the brethren there. For you became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For you also have suffered like things of your own countrymen. You see that? Even as they 
the, the churches of Christ in Judea, they, even as they have of the Jews. So your own countrymen are the Jews. Okay, that, that would be the disbelieving Jews, the disobedient Jews, okay? Who both killed the Lord Jesus, that's the disobedient Jews, and their own prophets, that's the disobedient Jews, and have persecuted us, Paul says. And they please not God and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sins always. For the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. Now, do you see who Paul says the wrath is come upon? Is coming upon the Jews. Do you see that? Their countrymen, the disobedient Jews, who were persecuting the Thessalonian Christians, who killed the Lord Jesus, who killed their own prophets, and were presently persecuting the apostles. Do you see that? All right, now, let's go over to chapter 5. And I want you to look at what Paul says here. And he says here, But of the times and seasons, brethren, now, okay, hang on to that. We, we've got to look at something while we're here. Notice that before Jesus ascended, when he met there with the eleven, uh, Judas had hanged himself, remember that. And uh, Jesus here tells them that they're going to receive this promise for the Father, uh, of the Father, from the Father, of the baptism of the Holy Ghost, okay? And it's going to be not many days hence, okay? And it says, When they therefore were come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? So you see what they're asking? They're asking about the establishment of the kingdom. Do you see that? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. Do you see that? You see, this is parallel to what Jesus said in Matthew 24 and verse 36. Okay? No man knows the day or the hour, which we hear that all the time. You see, this it's, it's, he's saying the same thing, just in a different way. It's not for you to know the times or the seasons. So at this point, it wasn't for them to know the times or the seasons. But look what Paul tells the Thessalonians. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. Again, who's Paul writing to? Brethren, ye and you, the Thessalonian Christians. The brethren there, okay? For yourselves, the Thessalonian Christians, for yourselves know perfectly, you see that? That the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. You see that? For when they, now I want you to notice the contrast here between the Thessalonian brethren and they. There's two groups of people here he's referring to, okay? For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not <clears throat> escape. Do you see that? He says, you, brethren, you're not in darkness, right here. You are not in darkness. But he says, they shall not escape this day of the Lord that's coming like a thief in the night. Do you see that? But you, Thessalonians, you, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day, what day? This day of the Lord, that's coming like a thief in the night. You see, they they knew perfectly, they knew perfectly of the times and the seasons. You see that? Of the coming of the day of the Lord. So they were not in darkness, that that day would overtake you, them, the Thessalonian Christians, as a thief. Do you see that? Do you see what Paul just said here? He just told the Thessalonian brethren that they would not be overtaken like a thief. This day of the Lord that's going to come like a thief in the night on them that don't obey the, go the gospel, as we'll see in just a minute. Okay? Just now, now read that and let that soak in. Okay? Let that permeate down into your, your thought processes and realize that he says that all the times and seasons they knew perfectly of the day of the Lord coming like a thief in the night, and because of that, they were not in darkness, that that day of the Lord 
would overtake them like a thief. You see, they would escape. While their disbelieving countrymen, who was persecuting the Jews, who killed Christ, who killed the prophets, and who was persecuting the apostles, they would not escape because the wrath was come upon them to the uttermost. Okay? All right, now, we move right on over to First Th or Second Thessalonians 1, and I want you to notice a few things here. Again, Paul, uh, Silas, and Timothy are writing to the church of the Thessalonians. So again, this is addressed to the Thessalonians. Okay, Grace unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth, so that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience, and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. Do you see that? The Thessalonian Christians were being persecuted. Okay? This is who Paul is writing to. This is who Paul is addressing. And he, he uh, was praising them for their patience and their faith in their persecutions and tribulations which they were enduring. Okay? which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. Do you see that? The Thessalonian Christians were suffering because of their faith. They were being persecuted right here. They were being persecuted by the disbelieving, the disobedient Jews. Okay? Seeing as a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. Okay, again, you have the contrast between two groups of people here. Paul is writing to the living, breathing Thessalonian Christians who were being who were undergoing persecution for their faith. Okay? And they were being persecuted by the Jews. Now he says, and to you who are troubled, okay, that's the Thessalonian brethren. They were being troubled, okay? Now he says, to you who are troubled, rest with us when? Now right here is a time statement. And, you know, I didn't make that up. I didn't put that in there. Holy Spirit put that in there. Okay? And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them. Who's them? What's he been contrasting? the persecuting Jews, okay? Taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of his glory, or excuse me, from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When, another time statement, he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe because our testimony among you is believed in that day. Now then, Notice, please, that Paul, again, is writing to living, breathing Christians who are undergoing persecution, and he tells them that they're going to receive relief from that persecution when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, who, that's the them, that's troubling the Thessalonians, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Folks, Holy Spirit, through Paul, is quoting right here Holy Spirit's own words from Isaiah chapter 2, verses 10, 19, and 21. Now just let that grab a hold of you and give you a good shaking for a minute, okay? <laughs> Uh, think about that. Apostle Paul, inspired of the Holy Spirit, quotes right here verbatim, not out of the Septuagint, but he quotes verbatim from Isaiah chapter 2, verses 10, 19, and 21, this phrase right here, that these the disbelieving, persecuting Jews, Israel, would be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Do you see that? Now, 
again, Paul in writing to living, breathing Thessalonian Christians who were being persecuted for their faith. The Thessalonian Christians were being persecuted for their faith by the Jews, as we just looked at in 1 Thessalonians 2, uh, verses, or excuse me, 1 Thessalonians 1, verses 2, I still said that wrong, 1 Thessalonians 1, chapter 2, uh, verses 15 and following. And you can confirm that, compare that with Acts chapter 17 also, okay? Now, Paul was promising these Thessalonian Christians relief from their persecutions, okay? And Paul was promising the Thessalonian Christians that their persecutors would become the persecuted because it, the persecution was going to be turned back on the persecuted, okay? And Paul said that the Thessalonian Christians would receive relief from their persecutions and the persecutors would become the persecuted when the Lord Jesus would be revealed from heaven in flaming fire. And Paul told the Thessalonian brethren that they would escape this day of the Lord coming like a thief in the night. 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 1 and following. Okay, that you just looked at. And Paul said that when the Lord would be revealed from heaven in flaming fire with his mighty angels, that he would punish the persecuting Jews, that is, old covenant Israel, with everlasting destruction, quote, from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Again, which is a verbatim quote from Isaiah chapter 2, verses 10, 19, and 21. Now, in order for the Thessalonian Christians to receive relief from their persecutions when the Lord is revealed from heaven in flaming fire, then the Thessalonian Christians had to be experiencing persecution when the Lord is revealed from heaven. Do you see that? Now, in order for the Jewish persecutors to become the persecuted when the Lord is revealed from heaven in flaming fire, then the Israelite persecution of the Thessalonian Christians had to be ongoing when the Lord was revealed from heaven in flaming fire with his mighty angels. Do you see that? Okay. Therefore, if Jesus was not revealed from heaven in flaming fire during the lifetime of the Thessalonian Christians, then not only is Paul a false prophet, Jesus is also a liar because the gospel that Paul preached is a direct revelation from Jesus. Galatians 1 verses 11 and following. Now, if what Paul is predicting here to the Thessalonian Christians that we've just looked at, especially in 2 Thessalonians 1, if this is yet in our future, then Old Covenant Israel and the Law of Moses, that is their covenant, you know, then it will have to be reinstated. And then, once again, Israel must be engaged in an ongoing persecution against the Thessalonian Christians or at least against Christians so that the Lord can be revealed from heaven in flaming fire in judgment against Old Covenant Israel. Do you get that? You see, there is no prophecy of a last day's judgment of Jehovah against the world in vindication of Israel. Okay? And you see, this blows the dispensational paradigm just completely out of the water. Okay? You, you need to catch that. You need to get that. Okay? There is no prophecy of a last day's judgment of Jehovah against some entity that would come against Israel and where in which he would come in vindication of Israel. Okay? The judgment of the Lord at the day of the Lord, this last day's day of judgment was against Israel for persecuting Christians. Okay? If you still don't get that, stop the video, back it up, and listen to it five more times, okay? And it'll make sense. And you'll see, you'll go, wow! I never saw that before. And it just it totally refutes 
this dispensational ideology and that uh, Israel's becoming a nation again, you know, 1948 and, and all the hoopla around that. Anyway. Okay, so we're going to close the video here. And I want to remind you of Romans 15 and verse 4. Again, remember Paul said there that whatsoever things were written aforetime was written for our learning. And Peter said that he was reminding his readers of what the holy prophets had predicted. And he said, nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth. According to his promise. The prophecies of the Old Testament. The old prophets, okay? The holy prophets. And Paul said that those things that were written aforetime was written for our learning. Now remember that I told you that I was going to... I, I know that everybody gives lip service to believing what Paul said there, and they agree with that. But I was going to put you to the test. Now, do you, do you really agree with what we just read from the prophets? And do you agree? And again, now, I didn't make this up. I'm just pointing out to you what you can read and what you have read from your own Bible with your own eyes. Okay? I didn't make this up. This is Holy Spirit's application of Holy Spirit's own words. Okay? Holy Spirit moved men to write those words. Holy Spirit moved Isaiah to pen those words, those predictions of this last day's day of judgment of the Lord at the day of the Lord. Okay? Then Holy Spirit moved Paul to write these words down and apply Isaiah, that prediction, and apply the fulfillment during the lifetime of the Thessalonians. Now, that's what the text says. Okay? Now, you need to, again, study that. Study it closely. Okay? So, we're going to close the video and just, just keep that in mind that whatsoever things are written four times, written for our learning. And I'm, well, I may hammer that a few more times as we go on. And uh, I'm, I'm going to put you to the test to see if you really believe that. Or if you've just been uh, giving lip service to that all these decades. Okay? So, uh, until the next video then, uh, please keep studying these things. Uh, like and share the, uh, these videos with your friends and, and neighbors and, and fellow Christians and so forth. And encourage them to come and study. Study with us here at What the Bible Says Ministry. Because that's, that's all I want. And that's all I want you to want, is what the Bible says in context, correctly exegeted, exegeted and, and use uh, consistent hermeneutics in studying uh, God's holy word. So until the next video, God bless you in your studies, and you have a blessed day.